During this season of Lent, we are focused on the spiritual discipline of prayer, and we're trying to make that available to all of you through our prayer stations, through our hands-on prayers activities after worship today, and then through a sermon series which focuses on the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, and that is, for many of us, the first prayer that we memorize and learn to pray. This morning, our second lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, Luke's version of when Jesus teaches his disciples this prayer. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some years ago, Ed Bradley interviewed a family on 60 Minutes. The family consisted of a religiously devout mother in her 30s, an almost painfully shy father, and their 10-year-old daughter who was confined to a wheelchair with spina bifida. Each year of their child's life, this family made a pilgrimage to Lourdes in France, a place renowned for the physical healing that has occurred there. Bradley was giving this family a bit of a hard time. Clearly, he found them gullible and impressionable. At one point, he turned to the girl and asked her, when you pray, what do you pray for? Without hesitation, she answered, I pray that my father won't be so shy. It makes him terribly lonely. That stopped Bradley for a moment, but he quickly recovered and forged ahead, questioning the family's priorities and their wisdom, suggesting that it was a bit ridiculous to pay thousands of dollars each year to go to France when they still had no miracle to show for it. But the mother, looking at her beloved daughter, simply answered, Oh, Mr. Bradley, Don't you get it? We already have our miracle. What do you think Ed Bradley expected that family to pray for? What would we expect such a family to pray for? Was their prayer answered? Even if the answer was that the whole family had an unshakable faith, and that a young girl who could have so easily focused on her own debilitating physical condition instead had the deep love and insight to pray not only for herself, but for her father? Was not the miracle here a family praying the way they live, with faith 
and hope and love and living the way they pray. We live as we pray, which begs the question for all of us, how and when and why do we pray? What do we pray for? What do we expect to happen when we pray? And what does it look like to have our prayers answered? Well, maybe it is a comfort to know that these questions we find so difficult to answer were questions Jesus' followers struggled with, too. By the time we get to this part of Luke, the disciples have been watching Jesus for a while now with a growing sense of excitement and amazement. They've seen Jesus teach, heal, cast out demons, and calm, raging storms. But the disciples have also observed that Jesus is a man of prayer. Before meals, after them, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, in the middle of the day, clearly Jesus knows something about prayer. And the disciples could only hope that he might share his knowledge with them. And so they ask, throwing in a little peer pressure for good measure, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. For once, Jesus gives them a simple, straightforward answer. When you pray, say this, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive our sin, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. What a relief it must have been to the disciples to finally get some clear instructions from Jesus. And compared to what faithful Jews were used to when it came to prayer, this prayer was a piece of cake. At that time, Jews prayed three times a day, at sunrise, at 3 p.m., and again at sunset. They prayed not sitting down, but standing up to demonstrate reverence toward God. Their prayers consisted of a series of 18 prayers, always said in Hebrew, no matter the native language of the person praying. So this prayer Jesus offered was a breath of fresh air to the disciples, short, easy enough to remember, and in their own language. But just when the disciples thought Jesus had offered them something they could get their heads around, something they could easily understand and share with others, surely they discovered, as they began to pray this prayer, that it was far from simple. And no part of this prayer is more complicated, more challenging to get our minds around than that very first phrase, Father, hallowed Be thy name. Or, as we typically pray it in our Lord's Prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. In this one phrase resides the central paradox of the entire Christian faith, that our God came to be one of us in an intimate, personal way in Jesus, and that that same God, is the very essence of holiness, of otherness. This prayer Jesus offers his followers does nothing to solve the mystery of faith. Instead, it reveals that God is more mysterious than we could have imagined. To our question of whether God is our intimate, loving parent, or a deity entirely removed from us, residing in some heavenly realm, Jesus simply answers, yes. The word paradox literally means beyond thinking or beyond believing. A paradox is a statement that at first seems completely contradictory, but upon further reflection contains a kernel of truth. The theologian Soren Kierkegaard believed that faith itself is a paradox, because faith is believing in something we cannot see or prove. If we live as we pray, 
And if we pray the prayer Jesus taught us as Jesus taught it, then just by our prayers alone, we live into this paradox that God is both our Father, our intimate, personal, loving God, who art in heaven, who is completely removed, completely utter, other, completely holy. In his updated translation of the Bible called The Message, Eugene Peterson translates this opening phrase of the Lord's Prayer like this, Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Indeed, the closer we look at these opening words, the more we find that in them Jesus reveals something to us about the nature of God. Like us, the disciples, we're really looking for answers to the questions, when, how, and what should we pray? Instead, Jesus gives them an answer focused on who. To whom are we praying? Now, the word Father was not a new way of referring to God, but the word Jesus used for Father was not the classical Hebrew word that showed up in all those daily Jewish prayers. Instead, Jesus chose a word from the Aramaic language, the native language of the disciples. He is instructing them to talk to God in their own language, using words that have deep and personal meaning for them. The word Jesus uses here is Abba, an Aramaic word for Father. The author Ken Bailey was once teaching the Lord's Prayer in Arabic to a group of women in the Lebanese mountains. He described Abba as an Aramaic word used 2,000 years ago, and when he did, he noticed that the members of the class started to get restless. Finally, he stopped and asked the women if they had any comments. One of them raised her hand and said, Dr. Bailey, Abba is the very first word we teach our children. Abba is a word with deep significance and meaning in the Middle East. It is used to address a superior and show our respect, but it also indicates a profoundly personal relationship between the one speaking and the one being called Abba. This is the word Jesus tells his disciples to use when praying to God, not to suggest that God is a man or that God can best be understood through our earthly parents, but to show that God's name is as elemental to us as the first word we learn to speak, that God is the first to care for us and provide for us, that as Psalm 139 tells us, God knows us and loves us completely. While I was in seminary, I once attended a church with some of my classmates. This church had no pews, no organ. The music was contemporary praise songs accompanied by a band and lead singers on microphones. It was a worship that touched all of us deeply, but one of my classmates took issue with the lyrics to some of the songs. They make it seem like God is our best friend, she said. Something about that just doesn't feel quite right. It is possible to take comfortable familiarity with God to extremes, and we can do this if we only think of God as our Father, our Abba. We live as we pray, and if we only pray Abba, then we risk becoming too focused on the God who reaches out to us to establish a personal relationship with us. We risk forgetting that this God is also entirely other, that God is holy in ways we can never be. So to help us understand this and correctly use this word Abba for God, Jesus tells us that we are then to affirm God's holiness, God's otherness, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
This phrase reminds us that the God who created and loves and provides for us cannot be reduced to something we carry around with us and pull out whenever we have need. The God of the universe is truly beyond our comprehension. And this is what we affirm in the Lord's Prayer. Of course, it's also possible to go to the other extreme. Martin Luther, a monk in the 16th century, felt that the Roman Catholic Church had done just that. At the time, the Bible and all church services were in Latin, not in the language of the people, and salvation was mediated by priests who were considered closer to God than lay people. One of the many significant acts of the Protestant Reformation was that Luther translated the Bible into the language of the people and argued for the priesthood of all believers rather than a hierarchy of human holiness. Luther acknowledged the awesome holiness of God, but he also helped Christians recognize that God, as the loving creator of all people, longs to be in intimate relationship with us all. By giving us this intimate way to address our creator who is also wholly other, Jesus reminds us that in the end, prayer is all about relationship which is why he starts by telling us to address God by name. Prayer is about a relationship with God who is closer to us than our very breath, and at the very same time, utterly holy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So, is God our intimate, loving parent, or is God so holy that God is entirely removed from us? With this first sentence of this prayer, Jesus answers, Yes. Yes, when you pray, come to God with expectant hope that God hears and responds. Yes, in your prayers, be open and vulnerable with the one who created you, knows you, and loves you completely. Yes. Pray not just in a way that is transactional, but relational. For in prayer, relationship is created and nurtured when we reveal ourselves to God with all of our doubts and contradictions, and when we open ourselves to God, the paradoxical one who is profoundly intimate and wholly other, when we open ourselves to God being revealed to us. Amen.